This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our um, an extra session of the IHR Digital History Seminar. I'm very pleased this evening to introduce and to have speak for, for us this evening Ryan Cardell, Dr. Ryan Cardell from Northeastern, where he is an assistant lecturer, uh, assistant professor in the English department there, and a core faculty member of the TextMap Network. Um, he has more, most recently published in the ACLS, but you can find his publications by going to viraltext.org. Um, this current year, he's been on um, a research fellowship, mainly in um, taking place in Leipzig, but more recently, um, for this month, he's been here in London at UCL, um, University College London, and uh, with the BL. Um, this evening, Ryan's going to talk about the best mechanical paper in the world, Scientific American, reprinting, and the circulation of popular science in 19th century newspapers. Before, but however, before I pass over to Ryan, I'll just let you know that we are recording um, um, this afternoon's paper and following on from the questions, so just be aware of that. And when we do come to the questions, please speak as clearly and loudly as you can to make sure those following online can follow. Okay, Ryan, I'll pass over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, well thanks everyone, I appreciate the invitation to, to speak here. And um, as I usually do when I talk about work coming out of the Viral Text Project, I'll be sort of moving between things. It's a pretty big and expansive project. Uh, it has lots of tendrils in different disciplines and, and uh, different areas. And so I'll be talking a little bit about the larger project and what we're doing with reprinting, and then honing in specifically on some of the most current research that I've been doing coming out of the project, which is into the role of Scientific American in the reprinting circuit in the uh, 19th century US and then beyond, uh, looking at also the UK and uh, European newspapers. Um, so just to warn you, there'll be sort of parts that are delving into this new research, parts that are kind of backing out and talking about the larger project. So, okay. So on its current website and in magazines, Scientific American claims to be the longest continuously published magazine in the US and, quote, the world's leading source and authority for science and technology information for science-interested citizens, delivering understandable, credible, and provocative content to an audience of more than five million people worldwide. In my talk today, I want to focus on the beginnings of this periodical, which was founded in 1845 with a slightly narrower focus and format. While by the early 20th century, Scientific American was clearly a magazine in the modern sense, issued monthly with elaborate illustrations. In its first decades, it was more akin to a newspaper with which it shared both its length. Uh, it began as a four-page um, issue and then became an eight-page issue. Uh, a weekly publication schedule and tight three-column format, which you can see here. The early Scientific American was a journal, but it was a serial journal. Um, Scientific American's founding editor, Rufus Porter, embodied the journal's eclecticism. He was a prolific inventor who, according to his obituary, printed in Scientific American, worked on, quote, turbine water wheels, windmills, flying ships, rotary engines, and sundry contrivances for abolishing as far as possible agricultural labor, as well as war engines, clocks, railway signals, churns, washing machines, and other appliances all while also working at times as a schoolmaster and a portrait painter. Porter only ran the journal a few years, but it continued to be a hybrid publication, blending the mechanical and practical with the cultural and political. Subscribers would receive a cover for each volume of the publication so that when the volume was finished, they could bind all the numbers together. Those individual numbers, however, quite closely resembled the newspapers of the period. Most prominent in any issue would be reports of new patents that had been filed at the U.S. Patent Office. As you can see uh, somewhat here, in this uh, patent for a new musical instrument, the viol seraphine, uh, in the issue from September the 26th, 1846. From 1859, Scientific American actually operated a patent agency in Washington, D.C. to help inventors 
uh, file, generate, uh, file with the patent office and of course to generate new content for the paper. In addition to its patent reports, however, Scientific American published a wide variety of material, including jokes, travel narratives, history, poetry, fiction, and of course co other columns describing scientific, medical, and technological wonders. It is in this mis miscellany that Scientific American perhaps most resembles its newspaper contemporaries, who, as Sari Edelstein uh, says, increasingly, quote, appeal to populations looking to the press for a blend of information and amusement. Indeed, in advertisements, which were often printed in newspapers, Scientific American is touted as the best mechanical paper in the world. My, my title and my emphasis on that word paper, a tagline that highlights the publication's hybrid identity as both a technological journal and a newspaper. I'm going to, in this talk, develop two notions of early Scientific American as a mechanical journal. It was both a central source of popular scientific and technological information during the period, and as a newspaper within the exchange system, it was an exemplar of the increasing mechanization of news during the period. So uh, just really briefly, uh, I, I'm talking to historians, so actually I might not have to do as much of this as I often do, but uh, I, I like to talk a little bit just about 19th century newspapers themselves, because I think that when we think about 19th century newspapers, if we think of them through the lens of 20th century newspapers or 21st century newspapers, we, we misapprehend them a bit. Um, they were a different beast. They included things that we would expect newspapers to include. They included political, uh, military news. They included things like opinion pieces. But they were far more hybrid than I think we tend to think with newspapers today. There was lots of other kinds of content. We have manners. There's nothing which adds so much to a young man's success in life next to honesty of purpose is the practice of good manners. This is a kind of advice column, maybe a mismanners sort of column for the 19th century. Um, Lots of these sort of what we might call editorials, but broader sort of reflections, um, sometimes quite sentimental reflections, um, sometimes quite religious reflections. There's an awful lot of religious content, explicitly religious content, particularly in American newspapers during the period. There's lots of uh, what we could class as like pedagogical advice, advice for parents about raising children, advice for educating children, um, uh, the proper means of doing that, sort of how to uh, deport yourself in the home. Uh, the other thing that uh, 19th century newspapers are full of are jokes. Um, Bob Nicholson here in the UK has done some uh, research into Victorian jokes in the newspapers recently, and we find columns and columns of jokes. Also lots of uh, what I refer to with my students as tweet-sized news, right? Uh, Oscar Benning of Dubuque butcher knifed his brother to death for being too intimate with Mrs. Oscar Benning. So a very sort of quick jolt of uh, some news from around the, the world. Here we have uh, both uh, some more jokes, but we also have a, a kind of uh, hallmark, uh, an aphorism, a sentiment, right? We have lots of these sort of short aphorisms in the newspaper. Most American newspapers also would have included um, explicitly literary content. Um, newspapers included a poem every day. Um, sometimes in the front on the front of the newspaper in the top left-hand column, sometimes on the last page of the newspaper in the top left-hand column. Every newspaper had their own conventions, but this was a frequent uh, feature that one would expect to find. And we also often have explicit, uh, explicit uh, fiction, uh, serialized novels. We have short stories. Um, the point that I really want to make is that for many readers, the newspaper was a kind of one-stop uh, source for both information and entertainment. It was read in a more sort of hybrid fashion than we might imagine. It wasn't yet divided into the sections even that we would expect from a modern newspaper where you get your news in one place and your sports in one place and your opinion in one place. It was all kind of jumbled up in on the pages. Um, a few other things just to sort of have in mind, most newspapers in the United States are explicitly political. They are, uh, in fact, the organs of a particular political party. And in most cities in the United States, most towns, you have not one but at least two newspapers, one for each of the major parties. Um, and in fact, we have this explosion of newspapers happening in the first half of the 19th century, in part because it's getting cheaper to make them. Uh, paper is getting cheaper, uh, the ink is getting cheaper, we have uh, steam presses, which are making it easier to print more, more quickly. Um, and it, it's really being turned to uh, political purposes, but uh, you can't fill uh, you can't fill the page every single day with nothing but politics. You have all this other stuff inside the newspaper. 
I'm not going to talk about it too much. Uh, recently, one of the things that we've done in the viral text project is an attempt to just sort of take one page of a newspaper and heavily annotate it so that you can sort of move around this exhibit and you can see how all of the different texts in this newspaper connect up with other texts that were being reprinted in other newspapers and, and how they reflect the sort of broader newspaper culture. So this is one thing you might check out that uh, I and Abby Mullen and uh, Jonathan uh, Fitzgerald, who are two graduate students working on the project, I worked on uh, some this past year. So one of the things, and the thing I'll be mostly talking about today, that we find an awful lot of in the newspaper is what I've referred to as information literature. This is popular science, this is trivia, this is uh, recipes and sort of like home remedies, all kinds of things that we might classify broadly as science. This is a good example from this page we've been looking at, who ate Roger Williams. This is an essentially an account of what happened to Roger Williams' body after it was buried under, under a tree. The roots of the tree came down and essentially absorbed his body in the shape of his body, and it became quite the sensation that the, the body of Roger Williams was now uh, uh, encased, not encased, it sort of become the, the, brand, the roots of this tree. And uh, it's really, this comes, as you see, uh, out of a uh, chemistry textbook. Um, and this little column gets widely reprinted. Um, and that's the other thing that we want to talk about in terms of how newspapers were made in the 19th century, which is reprinting. So we have this explosion of newspapers. Um, what we don't have is a huge explosion of staff for these newspapers. Most of these are being run by relatively small staffs. An editor, perhaps a few staff members, a compositor who sets the type. Um, with very big urban papers, you might have a few editors, but these are quite small. Um, and the way that the newspapers are, com are put together is through reprinting. So any newspaper editor keeps what's called his exchanges list. This is a list of all the newspapers that he uh, subscribes to. Um, and then there's a list of the newspapers that he sends his paper to, the newspapers that subscribe to his. When those papers come in, he looks through the newspapers. Um, and tries to find things that he thinks his readers would be interested in. He cuts them out with scissors, um, and if he's going to put them in the paper immediately, he pastes them onto a, onto a board, hands it to his compositor, so his compositor can sit there and reset the article for their newspaper. If he's not going to use it immediately, he puts it into a drawer, and we have some evidence that these drawers are often sorted by size of article. So one inch articles, two inch articles, so that when you're then putting together a newspaper, you need three inches, you can open that column with the three inch articles and find something that you would like. Um, this isn't seen as a kind of violation of intellectual property. This is how newspapers are put together. Um, this is the expectation. Now there are certainly some more sort of literary authors whose work gets circulated in this way, who get angry about it. But within the newspapers themselves, this is just the way that newspapers operate. And with my students, I, I often, ask them to think about something like uh, blogs that sort of act as aggregators, something like the Huffington Post, right? Which is aggregating content from all over the web um, under a kind of common interface. And in many ways, the newspapers acted as aggregators for things that were happening all over. So we see some examples of this Who Ate Roger Williams getting reprinted in a few places. This was quite a widely reprinted piece. And one of the places where it was reprinted was the Scientific American. It didn't originate in Scientific American. They picked it up from the newspapers. Okay, so this view of newspaper culture focused on reprinting has really grown from my work recently in the Viral Text Project, uh, which we're using uh, sophisticated text mining algorithms in order to identify uh, reprinted text across historical periodicals ar archives. Uh, in the project's initial stages, we used those methods to uncover about two million reprinted uh, texts from the Library of Congress's uh, Chronically America collection. And since then, we've been expanding our purview to include uh, some magazine collections from the Library of Congress, including Making of America, which is where we get Scientific American. And this year, I've been uh, working essentially to expand our purview for, towards international reprinting, which we can talk about um, in the Q&A if, if people are interested. So I have to sort of take another uh, quick detour and just talk about the project itself and give you a sense of how we're finding these reprints because I think it's important to understand the method in order to understand what we know and what we don't know, essentially. So uh, when we think about reprinting, I've been interested in reprinting for a long time. Um, in the early days, I was quite excited to sort of figure out as a graduate student that if you were interested in reprinting, you could 
take a text and you could go to a digital archive and you could search for key phrases from that text and you could find lots of reprints of that text and doing, doing it that way. Um, I worked on an early project where I expanded the bibliography of this uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne story. Um, really, I worked for a few months and was able to uh, double the best bibliography that was known for this short story just by doing sort of keyword searching in these large uh, online archives. The problem with online archives, of course, is that you can't do this, right? You can only find the things that you know to look for because you have to have those key phrases that you're searching for. Uh, and when I got to Northeastern, I was really, really wrestling with this problem. Um, how can we find the most widely circulated pieces from the 19th century that we don't already know to look for? And so I started talking with a colleague of mine in the new lab. Uh, his name is David Smith. He's a computational linguist. He does work with natural language processing. <coughs> and he was quite interested in text reuse in online environments and was very intrigued by the really messy uh, data of historical newspaper archives. And so essentially the problem was this, right? Like, I want to know that this and this and this are quote unquote the same text despite a few things, despite the fact that during the 19th century, as these things circulated, they changed. You might have noticed that with that Who Ate Roger Williams piece, the titles were different in most of the reprints. Uh, names of authors change. Because the newspaper editors are trying to fit these things on the page, they're taking out lines, they're adding lines. Um, so there's all this changing happening in the 19th century, and then, of course, when we scanned them in the 20th and 21st centuries, we changed them again, because this is the actual text data that you're searching. Right? You're not searching the words on the image, you're searching the OCR recognized text. There's software that goes and it looks at that image and tries to find the words on the page and turn them into machine process processable data. And OCR is really, really quite good with 20th century business documents, which is what it was designed for. Um, it's uh, less reliable when it's working with uh, damage scans coming off of generally off of microfilm. Right? Um, this is actually, this is decent OCR. This is not bad for a historical newspaper OCR. Uh, chosen relatively at random. But you can see, right, that there are lots of mistakes. So that if I was searching for the precise phrases on here, I wouldn't necessarily find this example. Um, the challenge we had, another challenge we had initially with the Chronicling American newspapers is that that, that newspaper data is not divided into articles either. Um, you just have text for each page. So all of the articles on one page are kind of in one big text file. So we know that there are these things that we would, as human readers, call articles that are distinct, that match, um, but we need the computer to be able to recognize that, right? So uh, I'm gonna really briefly describe to you how we've been doing that. Um, essentially, we're using uh, a combination of, of engrams and shingling. So engrams, is this a phrase that means anything to people? Well, it might not. I can't tell the people online. So, um, n-grams are sequences of n words, right? So a four-gram, sequences of four words. Five-gram, sequences of five words. We've had the most success working with five-grams. If people want to talk about why, I'm happy to in the Q&A. But uh, essentially, the first thing that happens is that the algorithm builds an index of all the five-grams on every page. So that would mean per majesty dears to congratulate Majesty, dears to congratulate the, dears to congratulate the president. Imagine a window of five words length that's just sliding across the text and making an index, right? The next thing that it's gonna do is it's gonna look across all the pages and it's going to try and match up five grams that match on individual pages. Because one of the, one of the central insights that David had, it's kind of a brilliant insight, but um, also very obvious once you hear it, is that if there's not one matching five gram on, on a page, then there can't be more than one matching five gram on a page, right? And that actually saves an awful lot of computation time. So uh, to congratulate the president upon matches in these two, you can see how this, how this works, right? Essentially, the next step is that we, we you might think of these as dials we can turn. Um, there have to be a certain number of matching five grams between two pages within a certain threshold in order for it to see it as a match, right? And the idea here is that these texts don't have to match from end to end. They just have to have enough matching bits, right? And how many is enough is a thing that we can adjust. If we adjust down, then we get a lot more matches, but they're less reliable. We might get more junk. If we uh, adjust them up, then we get more reliable matches, but we get fewer, right? And then the last thing that it's going to do is it's going to go through. We've got all these individual potential matches, and it attempts to group them. 
So not just these two look like they're the same, but actually these 50 look like they're all the same. These 85 look like they're all the same text. Um, I'm vastly simplifying things. If David were here, I'm sure he would be cringing. But this is essentially how the algorithm works. And what we get are these sort of groups of texts that uh, the leaves are the same. We get this metadata um, about when they were printed, the OCR that's matched. This is the president's message in the US before uh, the modern era, the president didn't give up and give a State of the Union speech. He actually wrote a message and he sent it to Congress and then it was reprinted in the newspapers. So this is one example of that kind of reprinting. And this is just another sample, the soft answer by T.S. Arthur. T.S. Arthur was a very popular temperance writer during the period and this is one of his very short pieces that was, that was reprinted. And these are, these are just sort of small examples out of much bigger clusters so you can kind of see what this looks like. Because um, what it actually looks like is this. <laughs> um, this is the data that we get back, this sort of spreadsheets with an ID for each cluster, a number of reprints, the metadata, and then you know, ultimately a link. So that if you want to go actually look at one example of these, you can go back into the archive, because we're not, we're not grabbing the images or anything. So you can go back to the archive and check out the actual page image to, to see them. Um, we, we have a kind of, a, not, not a fantastic, but a, a usable uh, online uh, browser for some of our early uh, data, although this only includes the American data. We haven't got some of the more recent European data in here. Um, but it's a slightly more user-friendly way of kind of browsing those, those spreadsheets. It allows you to do some basic searching, things like that, to find things of interest. Okay, so this kind of unstructured, bottom-up approach to the newspaper has been remarkably generative, leading to a more capacious understanding of what Americans were reading and writing during the period. I went into this project in search of literature. I'm an English professor. I was looking for poems and stories um, that flourished in a print culture founded on textual sharing. Uh, in the broadest sense, I hope to expand our ideas of which poems and poets resonated with 19th century readers and to create new bibliographies of popular but critically overlooked literature. And on this front, the uh, project has been really promising. There's been an article published most recently about some of the poetry that we've identified here, the vast majority of which um, one would not find in, say, the Norton Anthology of American Literature. Um, this is anonymous poetry, uh, lesser known poets who were widely popular during the period. Um, those poems were circulating within this system of exchanges and selection, um, but recognizably literary genres have only been a small part of the project. One of the most dramatic outcomes of the work thus far has been to highlight for me the importance of other genres of everyday reading and writing within the ecology of 19th century print culture. Uh, species of writing including political news and travel accounts, squibs, scientific reports, inspirational exhortations, all that stuff we were talking about earlier. As a general rule, the most frequently reprinted pieces are concise, quotable, widely relatable texts that would have been easy to fit in gaps on the physical newspaper pages as editors and compositors needed. And this has shifted my view of more familiar literature to account for a more a broader and messier ecology of networked print culture. Uh, we have a recent article in American Literary History where I argue that authorship in 19th century newspapers should be understood as a kind of network effect as stories moved through the exchange system under constant revision, amendment, and erasure. Uh, these networks can be graphed in order to illuminate textual exchange at a macro scale. Um, so we look at the texts themselves, we also use those texts to try and understand the systems of reprinting uh, during the period. So you guys have probably seen a network graph before, but essentially you know, these are newspapers here, um, sized by their influence within the network, which in this case has to do with how many texts they print that other newspapers reprint. Uh, the lines between the newspapers indicate shared reprints between papers. Um, even very thin lines in this case are a few hundred shared reprints, and these very thick lines are tens of thousands of shared reprints over about a 10-year period. Um, obviously, this is a, one way of sort of sussing out relationships within this massive uh, data that we then can dig into more closely. So we see a strong connection between two papers, uh, then we go back to those papers to see if we can determine, is this a political affiliation, is this some kind of professional relationship between the editor or something like that. Um, and uh, I have a few examples of uh, sort of insights that this has led to, but the important one for today is uh, what I'm about to show you. So um, 
we're looking at this network analysis that includes both newspapers from the Library of Congress's Chronicling America database and the magazines and journals from the Library of Congress's Making of America collection. Uh, granted, that latter, that, that magazine corpus, is much smaller, but we can still see that while informational commerce was uh, particularly thick among newspapers as, as a group and among magazines as a group, um, our magazines are kind of isolated up here. They're not as thickly connected with the newspapers themselves. Um, typically, though, by no means exclusively, while newspapers borrow from the magazines, which is why the magazines largely cluster together in this graph, uh, we don't see the reverse. We don't see as much of the magazines reprinting from the newspapers. So it's kind of one-way commerce between these communities. Um, newspapers were typically four-page affairs that ran weekly or even daily. Magazines were typically much longer monthly publications. Um, so the magazines are focusing on less pressing content, such as poetry, travel narratives, so forth, which were ideal for borrowing from the uh, which were ideal for the newspapers to borrow when they had space to fill. If we look at Scientific American, though, we begin to see something a little bit different. Uh, among the magazines and journals in our data set, Scientific American is the most closely aligned with the newspapers from this sort of macro view, uh, exchanging more frequently with the newspapers than other magazines. Perhaps more importantly, however, we see Scientific American exchanged in both directions with newspapers. It was both a frequent source of popularly printed selections, and it reproduced popular selections from the newspapers. Between its founding and the end of the 19th century, Scientific American reprinted at least 22,000 texts in common with its newspaper contemporaries. Um, and this is the reason why I've been increasingly interested in Scientific American recently. Uh, going into this uh, project, I wasn't really thinking about Scientific American as a specific magazine. But when I noticed its close affinity to the newspapers through reprinting, I began to look at it more closely. Within the Making America data set of magazines and journals, Scientific American is distinct. It's the only publication in admittedly a relatively small group focused on science and technology rather than literary or religious culture. So within those magazines, it's the only sort of science magazine. And I found it striking that that would be the one most closely aligned with the newspapers. Um, and then just more recently, I uh, sort of honed this down to get a graph of just uh, all the all of the reprints that uh, Scientific American sort of shares with the newspapers and how that, what that tells us about uh, relationships. And we see things like, for instance, the Milwaukee Weekly Sentinel um, is both a frequent source and, um, both a source and they also reprint from Scientific American quite a lot, which is something, uh, this is really uh, a few days old. And this is like the next thing I want to look into is like what's going on with the Milwaukee Weekly Sentinel? Why is it so closely tied to Scientific American? I don't know yet, but I'm, I'm curious. It might turn out to be nothing, but it might turn out to be interesting. So, um, yeah, you can see some of these communities. This is the U. This is some more recent data that has UK papers as well. So you can see um, their little cluster up here, and we have some Australian papers in there. Okay. So, how might we explain the affinity of Scientific American with the newspapers? One way, which I've already hinted at, would be to focus on the format of the Scientific American, which certainly echoes the conventions of newspapers. Um, it was also a weekly publication like many newspapers, and the editors no doubt faced many of the same challenges as newspaper editors, needing to fill space and so forth. Uh, their reports on current patents were not sufficient to make up their pages, so they needed to regularly import content of other clients. So they turned to the exchange system. In addition to these practical similarities, however, I would also identify an ideological convergence driving the close relationship between Scientific American and the newspapers. Scientific American emerged into a marketplace increasingly captivated by those genres that I've elsewhere called information literature, lists, tables, recipes, scientific reports, trivia columns, and so forth. So here's an example, one of my favorites of what I would call information literature, a, a list of supposed facts about human life the whole number of languages spoken in the world amounts to 2,523, uh, namely 587 in Europe, 396 in Asia. So this is one of these things. We could call it a sort of list of trivia. We might even call it a list. Um, another sort of surprising thing to, for me to learn is that the list, the listicle, which we tend to think of as a sort of prototypical internet genre, um, is perhaps the most widely reprinted kind of thing in 19th century newspapers. They're just everywhere, which I was unprepared for going into this project. Um, so here we have this list. 
of facts. And as this uh, text circulated, the actual specific facts and the numbers changed quite a lot. Um, they seem in some ways irrelevant to the sort of rhetorical action of the piece um, because they, they new facts get added, facts get taken away, the numbers change. But the general structure of this piece remains largely intact as it circulates over um, quite a long time, as you can see, over several decades. Um, the popularity of such snippets no doubt stems in part from their malleability, right? A squib of interesting statistics requires little to no contextual prose and could help a compositor fill a gap on their page. Uh, certainly such pieces were to some extent filler. When we read them individually, their ephemerality seems clear, right? If I came across this in the pages of a newspaper, I would sort of mark it as curious and probably not think much more about it. But depending on how precisely one wants to categorize things as information in literature, it accounts for between 20 and 25 percent of the most frequently reprinted pieces in our corpus of reprinting. And editors frequently claim the usefulness of such pieces to their readers in quite explicit terms, making it difficult to simply dismiss them as weightless for readers at the time. Uh, Let's look at another example of information literature that seems to have first been printed in Scientific American, Medical Uses of Salt, which is it's a long selection that attempts to show readers the great value of simple salt, which is, quote, almost a cure for everything, even in cases where mo more exotic medicines, quote, from the Persian Gulf or the wilds of Hindustan fail. While in many ways the remedies in this article resemble folk medicine rather than what we would call science, Scientific American was full of such pieces, printed alongside its expositions of current inventions, and sharing with them a kind of authority that was granted by the publication and its patent office. Um, and we can see here where this is uh, just one example of the reprinting in the Louisiana paper uh, that's sort of tacking on Scientific American, right? Um, these don't all start in Scientific American, but we'll talk about how the sort of authority of that name uh, will follow a piece, even if it didn't originate in Scientific American. Um, a curious calculation exemplifies another common type of information literature, uh, trivia. What is a billion? The reply is very simple, a million times a million. This is quickly written and quicker still pronounced, but no man is able to count it. You may count 100 or 170 in a minute, but let us even suppose that you may go as far as 200, then an hour will produce 12,000, a day, uh, 288,000 and a year of 365 days, 105,120,000. Let us suppose now that Adam, at the first beginning of his existence, had begun to count and had continued to do so and was counting still. He would not, even now, and according to the usually supposed age of our globe, have counted near enough. For to count a billion, he would require 9,512 years, 334 days, 5 hours, and 20 minutes. So we've got a little bit of. Um, uh, create well. Uh, this is this is when is our year here? This is pre-Darwin, right? Yeah. So, uh, but uh, yes, we, we have some echoes of that, right? But it would have been nine nine thousand years, which clearly no man we would not have had time to do as human beings, right? Under this account. Um, so I think that this uh, right. So this is one of the most successful snippets that seems to have originated in Scientific American. It was reprinted in at least one hundred and seventy-seven other publications. Uh, over the next decades. And one thing I want to point out, I, I, I like to show when I talk about these uh, sort of when they circulated, but one thing that I think is really important, and, and I think it bears on a broader study of virality, is that when we see these things that are printed over decades, they're not steadily printed over decades. Um, and this, this is, seems to be the general trend, actually, that you can get for almost any of these texts. What you get are these sort of flurries of activity, and then fallowness, and then activity again. And I suspect that what's happening is essentially a piece goes out into the out into the exchange system. It circulates. Editors print it. They see that other editors are printing it. Um, it disappears for a while, and then a couple of years later, an editor's flipping through one of those drawers, right? And he finds it again. He prints it, and then it sort of makes the rounds again. And this does remind me. I mean, it, it is frequently the case that I'll be on Facebook, and someone will sort of share a thing as new that I remember having sort of been a thing a few years back, right? They sort of rediscover it. Uh, sometimes it has to do with an event that's going on that sort of resonates with the video or whatever it is that they're sharing. And we, we do see this kind of trend with these, with these reprinted pieces as well. Um, 
So, like, while, while a curious calculation appeared in newspapers for more than 50 years, it was not steadily printed. We can mark cycles of attention. Um, interestingly, we can mark one smaller resurgence of the text in uh, sort of around 1863, when it was reprinted by Scientific American, but reprinted as a reprint. Oh, I don't have it up here. Um, so we have a later reprinting by Scientific American, which they claim to be getting it from somewhere else, and don't seem to be aware that they were the first uh, source of the text. Um, and we see that actually quite a lot. We see these texts moving back through the same papers, but with, without a kind of awareness that it's a re recursion. Um, so we can indeed see some evidence in our clusters that other per periodicals viewed a Scientific American as an authority. Though it was not first printed in Scientific American, this recipe for waterproof and shoes was typically attributed to Scientific American after it was reprinted there. So it kind of picks up an attribution. And for most of the reprints that we see after it appeared in Scientific American, it carried this, the Scientific American is quoted as saying, or it carried a dash Scientific American at the end of it. Um, demonstrating that the newspapers uh, were quite deliberately selecting from the journal and sought when possible, to borrow its authority through citation. And that, that's important, actually, because within this reprinting system, citation is very uneven. Sometimes things get cited. But one of the reasons why this computational approach has been so interesting is that it allows you to find all of these kinds of reprintings, even when they're not explicitly citing. And I would say, actually, most of the time, they don't explicitly cite. Um, so when you have a paper that does kind of like want that people do seem to want to cite. I, I tend to read this as meaningful. Um, while they were shorter and less rigorously researched than scientific books or journal articles, such snippets of information literature participated in and circulated a notion of progress and technological improvement during the period. Taking, taken as a corpus, information literature illustrates a changing notion of the role and rhetorical function of newspapers in 19th century US society. I think that these genres instantiate uh, the newspaper's emerging idea of itself as an information broker during the period. Sari Edelstein claims that modern ideas of journalistic objectivity began in the penny press journalism of the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, which is not really what we would think of as the rise of objectivity. The penny press is known for being quite sensationalistic. But it does have an emphasis on fact and science and claims to bring uncensored, up-to-date information to readers. And we do have evidence that the penny press is where we get this notion of eyewitness journalism, that people saw a thing uh, and are reporting it. So she focuses on the growth of eyewitness reporting and the penny press as a seed for modern ideas of impartial journalism. And I want to argue that another seed of this idea of objectivity can be found in the preponderance of this kind of information literature, which performed an idea of facticity uh, that precedes or exists outside of interpretation, uh, it claims to. And in these lists, recipes, figures, tables, I think we can spot a 19th century analog to 21st century ideas of raw data, which, as Lisa Gittleman has recently reminded us, is an oxymoron. Um, in publishing information literature, editors encourage readers to imagine the newspaper as a kind of serialized and communally offered compendium of useful knowledge, uh, a medium that could contribute to their intellectual, social, and practical well-being. Uh, indeed, the newspaper stakes its claim explicitly, that's another one of those, in pieces such as this one, in which the newspaper is described in a quip attributed to many famous Americans during the, the text circulation. So here it's Ju Judge Longstreet, at times it was Daniel Webster, at times it was other people, uh, who called the newspaper, quote, a history of current events, as well as a curious and interesting miscellany. Uh, students who regularly read a newspaper, the article insists, are always decidedly superior to those who do not because they have command of more facts, thus improving their schoolwork, future employment prospects, so on and so forth. So I think that the information literature in American newspapers stemmed from and contributed to the industrialization of knowledge during the 19th century. It privileged texts for their edification and usefulness to readers, not their originality. Um, when do we want to sort of end the go go to time. 20 minutes? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, no, I don't need that. I don't need longer than that. All right. So useful knowledge can be operationalized. And I think that the informational snippets in the newspapers operate in diverse ways. In some cases, they direct physical work, as in the recipes or the sort of home remedies. In other cases, they provide functional signals of kind of broad education. 
as in the list of statistics or the historical tidbits that we find. Such pieces are useful, in other words, as aids to the rhetoric and appropriate interests of middle class social and professional life. And in that latter function, I would trace a connection with other print genres of, of uh, information print genres, not new to the 19th century, but increasingly industrialized and available to the middle class, such as the dictionary, the encyclopedia, or, as with Scientific American, the journal. Certainly, Scientific American shared in its newspaper colleagues' rhetoric of usefulness. In its first mastheads, it was dubbed, quote, the advocate of industry and enterprise and journal of mechanical and other improvements. And then, when its new series began in 1859, quote, a journal of practical information in art, science, mechanics, agriculture, chemistry, and manufactures. By naming itself a journal of practical information, Scientific American signals that it expects its readers to not only ponder or discuss its articles, but to make use of them. And thus, we find in Scientific American not only these reports of patents, but uh, all these sort of scientific interest stories, home remedies, recipes, health advice. So, I mean, these are just examples of what I've been talking about this far, right? The length of days, how long is the day in different parts of the world, right? Um, you can see that getting reprinted. The largest flower and the largest bird, <laughs> right? These are these are just fascinating. I, I, I get more and more enamored of these the longer as I, I spend with them. This, one of the single most widely reprinted things of the 19th century, a cure for drunkenness, um, which also changes a bit as it circulates. But, uh, these ones from the Trove newspapers, I apologize, the images are a bit grainy, but just to sort of show that these are not only circulating in the US, but to the UK, to Australia, beyond. We have quite a global um, reprinting culture that we're looking at now. We have perhaps been too accommodating in republishing articles two or three times at the request of correspondence. However, we give you again Captain Hall's cure for drunkenness. Um, Captain Hall. So, yeah, this is where I want to get. Rhetorically, however, Scientific American maintains a complex relationship with the newspapers, both decrying the scientific inaccuracies that it claims propagates through reprinting and simultaneously um, reprinting from the newspapers quite liberally. When it prints material that originated in newspapers, uh, Scientific American rarely, if ever, acknowledges its source. Um, I find very little evidence of them citing newspapers. In fact, I don't know that I've run across any cases. Um, in such pieces, the selection is presented as a kind of atomized fact, divorced from its circulation and modification through the reprinting network. In this way, Scientific American both participates in the culture of reprinting by, while reifying the informational character of these selections even further, presenting the, these highly embedded and malleable textual objects as instead contextless and thus perhaps objective facts. When the early Scientific American does cite its sources, so here, this is uh, this article on, on eyesight about basically things you can do to preserve your eyesight as you grow older so that you don't, um, so you don't lose your sight. Then we have the reprinting in Scientific American, take care of your eyes, and you can see here Hall's Journal of Health. So we do have a kind of explicit citation here. When it does cite its sources, it often does so to correct errors. So here, a correspondent calls our attention to the following from the Philadelphia Ledger as a specimen of the erroneous character of many things which go the rounds of the press. So here we have a kind of snippet, a reprinted snippet, and then Scientific American goes on to sort of correct the scientific inaccuracies in this piece. Um, so as here, when it shames, quote, the erroneous character of many things which go the rounds of the press, when the editors in this example admonish their correspondent, and by implication their readers, that they, quote, must not expect scientific accuracy in the benighted daily press. We have long since ceased to expect it. They allied Scientific American's own active participation in helping the newspaper's information literature go the rounds, as we saw in the previous examples. Indeed, we can even find a previous reprinting of this very same advice in Scientific American five years earlier, <laughs> when it was assessed far more favorably by the magazine. So in uh, the Viral Text Project, we frequently discuss the idea of the 19th century press's institutional memory uh, we regularly refine, we regularly find material reprinted multiple times in a single publication over a span of years 
uh, with little sense that the publication or the editors, compositors, and so forth sort of realize the repetition. This is something we're still like actively working with. Like, what does this tell us about memory in these? Certainly, we know that editors were frequently changing publications. It was quite volatile. Um, but it is an interesting phenomenon to sort of see at scale. The short institutional memory likely stems from a few factors. Um, editors, publication names, affiliations were changing constantly, particularly within the US press. So it's highly likely that a selection added by one set of people in 1850 would be added by a completely different set of people in 1853, even within the same newspaper or magazine. But this also points to a cycle of attention not unlike what we see for viral content online today. Uh, and we've talked about this, this kind of repetition. In Scientific American's complex relationship to the newspaper's veracity, we might read echoes of a broader anxiety about knowledge production and dissemination, tracing connections with other print genres of information literature. Uh, I mentioned the dictionary encyclopedia. Uh, Chambers' information for the people, for instance, uh, sought to be the poor man's cyclopedia through uh, cheap print and serial publication. So, if, uh, I, so there's Chambers Encyclopedia. Um, information for the people essentially serialized that encyclopedia. It sent it out in parts that were relatively cheap, and the idea is that people could subscribe, could get all the parts, and bind it together and have an encyclopedia set. Um, information for the people was widely successful, appearing in multiple Scottish and American editions through the 19th century, and was touted in its later instantiation as the most striking example yet given of the powers of the press in diffusing useful knowledge. Um, so that would be here. The most striking example yet. Yeah, yeah. The, encyclopedia, the encyclopedia would, through the 19th and early 20th century, become an increasingly accessible marker of upwardly mobile middle class family life. And I see in the information genres of the newspaper a broad attempt to position that medium too as an accessible avenue of enhancing one or one's children's social position. We might draw a link between the philosophies undergirding the composition of dictionaries and encyclopedias and those undergirding 19th century newspaper exchange. In an article on the history of encyclopedic production, Joseph Regal and Jeff Loveland describe copying among encyclopedias in the 18th and 19th centuries as a normative practice. They note, for instance, that prominent 18th century encyclopedist Ephraim Chambers declared it, quote, idle to pretend anything of property in things of this nature. In this quote, we might identify another precursor to this notion of raw data, an idea that the encyclopedia's articles merely report facts that exist independently of the writer and thus cannot be owned. Um, Regal and Loveland's claim that American publishers would justify their piracy of British encyclopedias as a service to their, quote, knowledge-hungry compatriots aligns with Meredith McGill's arguments about the 19th century culture of reprinting in the US, where reprinting was actually seen as a kind of democratic value or even necessity, right? We have to share information, um, which we could even tie to like more recent ideas, like information wants to be free, right? Do we hear about the internet all the time? Um, the simple act of reprinting, then, entangles ideas about knowledge, information, property, and objectivity, a complex interplay of ideals and practical realities that shaped what circulated to periodicals readers during the 19th century and how it was conveyed to them. Scientific American borrowed facts and other texts from the newspapers, including poems and fiction, which I haven't discussed today. When it did so, it cited strategically, at times reprinting selections anonymously in order to enhance the objective truth value of the reprinted text for its readers. Such contradictions pervaded across the system of reprinting, but we can mark in this instance a clear and deeply ambivalent attitude towards the newspapers, which were both essential to Scientific American's publication and yet viewed as suspect by a publication that promised to provide scientific truth among a raucous culture of information overload. Uh, the articles in Scientific American were clearly viewed by other newspapers in the US and in other countries as worthy of particular attention, um, which only increased as the century progressed and the journal moved away from its early days as a newspaper magazine hybrid and towards a kind of more authoritative magazine publication. Uh, so where does this leave us? I have in this talk singled out Scientific American as one example of how computational reading across an archive might reorient our view of its contents. I did not begin the viral text project in search of Scientific American's influence on 19th century newspapers or its role in the reprinting network more broadly. Instead, we constructed a view of the archive that focused on textual patterns rather than content, 
um, on the frequency of repeated strings across words, across millions of pages. And one interesting pattern that emerged was the prevalence of this kind of information literature, while another was the close association of this particular journal with its newspaper contemporaries. Taken together, these two patterns constitute what we might call an emergent research interest suggested by the data, rather than an existing research interest that we brought to the data set. Um, and here, I was just briefly can talk about uh, sort of future work. So one of the things, as I said, that I've been doing this year is working to expand what began as a US-centric project to look at international reprinting. I mean, unsurprisingly, if you start looking at reprinting in American newspapers, you almost immediately begin to perceive the influence of particularly uh, papers from the UK, but then even from Europe and beyond. And we wanted to sort of, we wanted to actually get a handle on that and see what was going on, what kind of American content is being exported, what are we importing most predominantly from abroad. And so I've been spending this year on an ACLS fellowship, uh, essentially gathering newspaper data from around the world. And one of the things, I mean, we knew that international reprinting was happening, but the sort of extent of it was almost immediately striking to me. Um, Australia feels very far away from the US in the 19th century in particular, and we're finding um, just about anything that's widely reprinted in American newspapers is also widely reprinted in Australian newspapers, quite reliably. Um, I, this is my one example. Beautiful Snow is this example of one of these poems that no one's ever heard of that I'm beginning to think was maybe one of the single most popular poems of the 19th century, um, reprinted in well, we know now of more than 350 newspapers where it was reprinted in the US. Um, it was reprinted in the UK, it was reprinted in Australia with glowing commentary. It also became the subject of an enormous debate about who the actual author was. Um, there were lots of candidates proposed, the newspapers were constantly um, arguing with each other about who the actual author of the poem was. And those uh, authorship debates also jumped uh, oceans, and we have Australian newspapers vehemently debating who the actual author of this poem was. We have UK newspapers vehemently debating um, who the actual author of the poem was. I spent most of my year in Germany, um, in part for practical reasons, I can read German, <laughs> um, but also because German is the second largest newspaper language in the United States in the 19th century. There's a huge German language uh, publishing industry. Um, and there was a kind of natural experiment there that gets us outside of English to see what kinds of exchanges uh, German language newspapers in the United States had with uh, German newspapers back in continental Europe. And, and also there were a lot of German papers, as it turns out, in Australia. Um, and there we've seen just some very early experiments. We've already begun to get some examples of these kinds of exchanges. There is quite a, a huge cluster about this, uh, this guy, Franz Müller, who's one of the very first people uh, in history, convicted of uh, murder on a on a train <laughs> uh, in London, actually, uh, he he murders a, a, a woman in on a train leaving London. Um, it becomes an enormous international sensation. His trial um, and his eventual con eventual conviction and execution. Um, reprinted in Germany, reprinted in the UK, reprinted in the United States in German, reprinted in English and uh, reprinted in these kind of translated interstitial versions where we have, you know, Müller, Ja, ich habe es getan. We have the, the, his confession in German and then, it, yes, I did it with the translation. Here, uh, I pointed this as an interesting one because we have these kind of interstitial texts. Our clustering algorithm as it stands was able to cluster the German language and the English language text together so that we have a kind of multilingual cluster of stories around this. Um, one of the next things that my colleague, uh, David Smith, really wants to work on is uh, whether we can do detection of reprinting through translation when we don't have these kind of interstitial texts in between, which is quite a complicated computational problem, um, very much a publishable problem for a computer scientist, and so this is one of the next things that we want to talk, uh, that we want to work on. And then we have, of course, um, fortunately, several uh, digitized German language newspapers in the US that allow us to make this, com this comparison. But ultimately, I think we want to move beyond this. We've been talking with people at the European newspapers and et cetera about getting lots of languages um, into the mix um, that other scholars might be able to work on, even if they're not languages that I could personally work on. Tessa knows about this a <laughs> bit, because we've been talking about that as well. Um, 
other work we've been doing, um, one of the uh, one of the graduate students on the project, Abby Mullen, although uh, I have to sort of sadly say that, sadly for me, Abby just got a job, <laughs> um, and so is no longer to be actively working on the project. She's been with us since the beginning. Um, one of the questions that she and I talked about quite a lot is like we, we can observe uh, reprinting from the newspapers that exist within our corpus, but of course we know that what is digitized is a small proportion of what exists now, which is a pro proportion of what existed then. And so one of the questions that we always have in the back of our minds is, is there any way to begin to get a sense of what we don't know from our data? And so what she did is she built quite a brilliant little script that goes through the run of a particular newspaper within a particular uh, sort of set of dates and tries to automatically extract all the places when that newspaper explicitly cites another newspaper. Now again, they don't always cite when they reprint, but we do have this kind of citation within newspapers. And it's still very preliminary, but what this allows us to do is, when I look through here, some of these newspapers are in our data. The New York Herald is, the Wheeling Intelligencer is, the Richmond. Uh, dispatch is, but many of these papers are not in our data set. And this maybe points us to papers that could be important to look at that are not yet digitized. Right? Um, and then she's done some work, you know, from that extracted data, uh, mapping all of the places that a particular newspaper cites over the course of a year. Um, and actually, this is a bit artificial because if they're citing from all around the world, that map gets so big that you can't really see what you're looking at. So this is just their citations in the US. It's, it's an Ohio paper. This is just their citations kind of in their region over that same period. And then you can build network graphs from those citations as well and compare these kinds of network graphs with the network graphs that we can build from explicit shared reprints, right? So here, these are the citations of just three newspapers over the course of, uh, I think this is a couple of years. And you can see the ones that we only know of, of a particular paper citing, one that two papers are citing in common and papers that all three are citing, which again is a way of maybe saying who the important papers are that we don't have in our data set. Um, the other thing we've been doing, and this is uh, Jonathan Fitzgerald, who's another PhD student in the project, has been really working hard on automatic classification. So in the early days of this project, I had this notion that we would find all these reprints and then we would build a database of them. And we would go into that database and we would annotate it we would give everything titles and we would tag it by content and then other scholars would be able to use it. And then we ran the algorithm on just American papers from before the Civil War and got something like 1.2 million clusters of reprints. Um, and there are four of us, right? So we're never ever going to tag these things by hand. But we do want there to be other ways of sort of delving into the data and finding what you're interested in. So one of the things that Fitz has been experimenting with is whether we can do some um, automatic sorting of the data. Um, and there's some things that uh, are quite, have been quite easy. Like it's quite easy actually to pull out all the poems. Um, poems are quite distinct formally. Uh, you can grab them and sort of separate them and then just have a data set of all the poems that we have. Um, it's fairly easy to separate like explicitly political content from other stuff. Where we've been struggling lately is we have this big thing just like prose that's harder to distinguish, but we're working on it. Um, and then he's done a bit of experimenting lately with sort of topic modeling, which is another method we can talk about if folks want, as a way, again, of trying to sort this stuff in ways that would be meaningful to scholars to find what they're interested in within the data. Scholars being us and scholars being other scholars as well. Yeah, so that's the stuff we're working on now. Um, these are all the people who are or have been involved in the project and people who have funded the project and uh, we can take questions, I think. Lovely, thank you very much, Ron.